One of my favorite ways to travel from Michigan to Wisconsin is aboard the Badger. She's the last operational member of what was once an armada of Lake Michigan car ferries. Being aboard her is really cool. From the time that you leave the dock and depart the harbor, to the glorious blue of the open lake and on to when you make your arrival in port. It is a cool crossing. In the late 1940s, there were as many as 15 of these huge steel vessels crisscrossing the big lake every day and every night, winter and summer. The earliest of these self-propelled, steam-powered, roll-on, roll-off, open lake Michigan car ferries was the Ann Arbor No. 1. She was a wooden 260-footer launched on September 28, 1892 at Toledo's Craig Shipbuilding Company. The Craigs made several drawings of potential car ferries, all showing the bow open to load and unload the cars. This design was not suited to the rough weather on the open lakes. Suddenly, George Craig conceived the idea of housing the bow but leaving the stern open for loading and unloading railroad cars. So the steamers Ann Arbor No. 1 and Ann Arbor No. 2 were built on that design back in 1892. It has been followed ever since. Here is Ann Arbor No. 1 early in her career. Originally, she had two smokestacks, one forward and one aft, but in her fourth season, the forward stack was removed. On December 2nd of that same year, her sister ship, the near twin Ann Arbor No. 2, was also launched at the Craig Yard in Toledo. Both boats were constructed under the supervision of master carpenter and soon-to-be-famous Great Lakes vesselman Frank Kirby. Like her older sister, this vessel also entered service with two smokestacks, but had the forward one removed. The Craig Yard followed up with two wooden giants in 1895. They were the Shenango No. 1 and Shenango No. 2. Each was 282 feet in keel length and had four tracks and could carry 26 rail cars. Yet these wooden vessels had serious limitations. Primarily when it came to breaking ice in the depths of the winter, they were somewhat limited. And that was on Lake Erie. Meanwhile, over on Lake Michigan, the Ann Arbors 1 and 2 were experiencing the same limitations. Secondly, Wooden vessels can easily burn. Which was the fate of the Ann Arbor No. 1 on March 8, 1910. And it was also the fate of the Shenango No. 1 on March 11, 1904. 
Long before the Ann Arbor No. 1's fire, the folks at the Ann Arbor Railroad Company in Frankfort, Michigan, were looking to the future, and that meant steel-hulled vessels. The Globe Iron Works in Cleveland were given the contract by them to construct the Ann Arbor No. 3, an all-steel Cross Lakes car ferry. She was launched on September 24, 1898. At 270 feet in overall length, she had a double bottom hull, and her deck was constructed with four tracks, allowing her to carry 22 railroad cars. However, the true prototype for all future Cross Lake Railroad car ferries was launched nearly two years before the Ann Arbor No. 3. On December 30, 1896, the steel car ferry Pier Marquette was launched at the F.W. Wheeler Yard in West Bay City, Michigan. She was 350 feet in overall length, 56 feet in beam, with four tracks, and could carry 30 railroad cars. From the moment that she arrived at Ludington on February 13, 1897, every Lake Michigan car ferry would follow in her footsteps. She was, in fact, the first steel car ferry on Lake Michigan. Her propulsion consisted of twin screws. She had two stacks arranged fore and aft, and they were located amidships. Additionally, her deck houses would set the pattern for all future car ferries, with the sole exception being the Ann Arbor's number three and number four. She had berths for all of her officers as well as for 10 passengers on her upper deck. Her regular crew were housed below the car deck. Those crew rooms as well as the engine rooms were illuminated by a 25 cycle electric lighting system. Because of that, the lights tended to flicker. Thus, those lower areas became commonly known as, quote, the flicker, unquote. Departing Ludington at 7 a.m. on her maiden trip to Manitowoc, the Pier Marquette carried VIPs such as Mr. S.T. Crapo in his private railroad car. Yes, at the time, he was the general manager of the Flint and Pier Marquette Railroad. The boat also carried a brass band to celebrate its arrival in Wisconsin. As the huge ferry approached the harbor, a cannon ashore was fired in celebration. The vessel's brass band played, and the local Manitowoc residents cheered. The only problem was that the big steamer was about six inches too wide to fit into the Northwestern Railway slip, so she had to be taken upstream to the Wisconsin Central Railway slip, where she fit quite well. Over the next half century, the fleet of Lake Michigan car ferries would grow. Normally, rail cars were nearly their exclusive cargo, although some had holds for bulk cargo such as grain. By the 1920s, many of the car ferries were carrying greater numbers of passengers. Some had their deck houses expanded for this need. In fact, in 1929, two new car ferries the City of Saginaw 31 and the City of Flint 32 were launched with passenger accommodations running the full length of their spar deck. These were the first Cross Lake car ferries designed as much for carrying passengers as they were for carrying rail cars. Each had a passenger dining room, a ladies observation deck, a man's observation deck, large state rooms, small staterooms, ladies' washrooms, and men's washrooms. Aft was the galley, which served not only passengers, but also the crew. Accommodations for the galley staff included four, quote, boys, who were actually the waiters for serving meals to the passengers, as well as the crew, two maids for servicing the passenger staterooms, plus a staff of cooks. 
There were also quarters for the engineering officers. The general crew were still housed in the flicker below the car deck. The onset of World War II, however, saw a new trend develop. Gas rationing influenced the desire of automobiles to be transported across the lake rather than drive around. The saving of nearly a full tank of gas was significant. Even if you had one of the, quote, A, unquote, stickers. Soon the ferry docks were modified with ramps that allowed passenger cars to be driven up onto the upper deck and parked there for the trip across the lake. After the war, this trend not only continued, but also started to grow. In 1951, the CNO Railroad was the owner of the city of Saginaw 31 and the city of Flint 32. But they were looking for expanding the role of passenger and automobile transportation. Christie Corporation of Sturgeon Bay was awarded the contract to build two new coal-fired steamers for that role. Launched on January 4, 1952, was the Spartan, named after the Michigan State University's mascot. Nine months and two days later, her twin was launched. Christened the Badger in honor of the University of Wisconsin, she had her bow wetted with champagne by Mrs. Charlotte Culler, the wife of the governor of Wisconsin. Seen here is the Badger in her original 1952 configuration. Both the Spartan and the Badger had 42 staterooms for their passengers. Each only had space for about 15 automobiles, however. Most of the automobiles in the 1950s were moved by the fleet mate of the Spartan and Badger. That was the City of Midland 41, which had the capacity for carrying 50 automobiles. The growth in passenger and automobile traffic became so great that the CNO had both the Pier Marquette 21 and 22 lengthened in 1953, and their staterooms increased to a total of 40. By 1961, the CNO ferry fleet were hauling 132,000 rail cars, 153,000 passengers, and 54,000 automobiles annually. During the 1970s, the process of moving rail cars past Chicago and around Lake Michigan improved greatly. Meanwhile, the expense of transporting them across the lake on vessels increased. In 1980, the CNO Railroad was granted permission by the Interstate Commerce Commission to abandon its cross lake routes. In the process, they also abandoned their three ferry vessels the City of Midland, the Spartan, and the Badger. A dozen years later, Ludington native Charles Conrad invested his own money in the purchase of the three ferry boats and formed the Lake Michigan Car Ferry Service. With that, the Badger found a new life transporting vacationers and their vehicles from Ludington to Manitowoc and back. Then in 2016, the vessel received the United States' highest historic honor as the Department of the Interior officially designated the Badger as a National Historic Landmark. As of the making of this video, anyone can make a reservation and take a trip across the lake on this historic vessel. I find it fun to remember the long history of these huge ferries while making such a trip. Even on the hottest summer day, it is always a cool crossing on the Badger.